The Elenavalk estate is one of the most historic estates in the region. It was founded in 1869 with my great-great-great-grandfather, so five generations ago. Right here in Tramin and, and, and up until today, uh, the cellars that we use are in this very old historic building so that was purchased in 1869 but winemaking really happened way longer before that. We even have an old barrel that dates back to seven, one, seven, 1700 something. So we know that even the monks, because this is a very old um, Jesuit um, monastery used to be, so we know that the monks even at the time must have been making wine in here. So a lot of history, a lot of wine that these cellars have seen and seen go through. Uh, anyway, so 1869 is when everything happened, when everything started with my ancestors five generations ago and the, fam the winery has been in our family ever since. So up until today, five generations later, later it's, um, it's my family, so the Valk family owning the, the estate. Everything changed with my mother Elena, right? She married into this family, so she married my father who was in the fourth generation of this estate. and. Um, she used to be a former architect and was born and raised in Milan and marriage took her to this small little town of Tramin where um, yeah, she soon realized there was nothing else but vineyards surrounding her. <laughs> so um, she always had this love and passion for wine but she wasn't a trained winemaker. So her idea was always to make wines that were somehow the true expression of a single side of a single parcel. Uh, to really produce single vineyard wines, wines that would speak for itself and would carry in a way a certain signature, her signature. She started coming in and introducing a completely new philosophy and had a vision for the estate and said, um, and obviously by, and started doing a lot of things differently and said, you know, let's reduce yields. That was obviously one of the first and most important things she did. The, the, the trellising system went from the, the old pergola to the guillot system. Varieties obviously is a major point. At the time, mainly, it was mainly Schiave that was being produced in Alto Adige. She introduced on a larger scale more international recognized varieties with the idea to really show the world the potential of our small little region. So she came in with a lot of ideas and, and, and a new vision for the estate, but really also for the region. And uh, well, at some point said to my dad, hey, if I have all these ideas, I want my name on the label. And that's what happened in 1988. So 1988 was really when she started with Elena Valk. And, um, and, and what, what originally thought to be a small pride, uh, side project to the actual winery soon became its own major estate. It's still called Wilhelm Mark, um, but the difference between the two, and, and so Wilhelm Mark is still alive, and Wilhelm Mark, uh is where we work with contracted grape growers, so really families that have been delivering grapes for many, many years and many generations. Um, so for example, we produce the Prendo Pinot Grigio, right, that's part of the Wilhelm Mark book, and uh, so we have farmers and families that deliver grapes. Whereas with Elena Valk, it's all estate fruit. So that's the difference between the two. This is the oldest barrel that we have that dates back to 1873, oh. right? And they're all hand carved, you can see, and, and really tell the story of my family and, and the wine making overall in the region of Alto Adige back in the days. So 1873 is the oldest that we have, and they go anywhere from, say, 80 hectoliters to 180 hectoliters. So you can imagine the size. It's all um, Slavonian oak, and um, they are completely original and we're still using them. <laughs> and then here, for example, it really tells the story of my, of my ancestors, of my family. So for every major anniversary or if someone passed away, they decided to dedicate a, bar a barrel to that person, to that happening. For example, this was done for the 85 years of the estate. Uh, this one was done for the 80th anniversary of the estate. And um, very beautiful is this is probably my favorite barrel here, right here. Um, I'm not sure if you can see, like, the, the, it's all hand carved, right? The engravings, but um, it really tells the story of how winemaking was done back in the days, right? And I mean, you look at the picture and you think, well, you know, it's old pergola system. Um, 
you know, hand, hand pick, we still hand pick, but we certainly don't crush the grapes and bring crushed grapes with oxes to the winery, right? So a lot has changed within those last, say, 40 years. And, um, uh, but it's, it, it's just a beautiful way of, of really um, preserving history and showing what, what winemaking was like back in those days. Our largest barrel, so 180 hectoliters, and it dates back to 1903. So we still use it, it's mainly being used for Scava, which is, is our indigenous grape variety that we, that we plant and produce. And now we go deeper down. The distributors that don't sell enough go in there. <laughs> <laughs> so here we have the uh, Kermes cellar. So unfortunately, it's quite empty right now as we're just starting, um, as we're just preparing for the new vintage to arrive, and hence the cellar you'll see it empty uh, right now. Generally, it's, it's, it's filled up with with, with barrels. Um, yeah. Any idea what we used to have in here before? You, you can see the ties, the beautiful glass ties. Any idea what was in here prior to the, those barrels, to these barrels here? These are old uh, concrete tanks okay. that were that went up until the roof. Can you see that the up here on, on the ceiling? So they were fixed up there. Yes. So very old concrete tanks that um, uh, all different concrete tanks, right? That you see here and um, that were needed at the time because a lot of quantity was being produced. So when my mom started, she didn't need that much quantity, but she needed much more space for her barrels. But just imagine like even when the, when the room is full of barrels, we would not even fill one of those tanks just to get an idea of how much wine we used to store in here. And hence these, barrel, these, these concrete tanks have been empty for a long time. And these tiles were the inside of these concrete tanks, right? So when my mom, mom needed more space, we decided to kind of cut those um, tanks out. And only then we realized that these were so nicely preserved uh, that we decided to keep them to really show the transition away from the quantity all the way to quality. And I mean, nowadays, Alto Adige is, um, is one of the smallest regions within Italy. So we contribute less than 1% to the total Italian wine production. But yet we're considered among the most um, um, highly qualified region, right? If you even look at wine awards and scores that Alto Adige gets, we really get a lot of awards and, and there's this beautiful chart showing awards compared to acres and Alto Adige is always number one. <laughs> so, uh, because we're so little but known for our high quality and, and certainly this goes back also to my mother who was really one of the pioneers in the high quality revolution that our whole region went through. This is a, a small tunnel, so you can see like how kind of deep and old these cellars are. So the deepest cellar is, is the next one, and that goes down about 10 meters below ground. These are brand new, I mean I still call it brand new, 2015 uh, fermentation cellar. And the idea of what building this new fermentation cellar was really to continue the very delicate work that we apply, that we apply in the vintage. Sorry, we're in the middle of vintage, right? So, um, to really continue the very delicate work that we do in the vineyards, also uh, bring that idea, uh, minimal intervention idea, also in the summer. So it's a completely gravity-driven uh, gravity uh, cellar. Grapes arrive on top, but they constantly kind of gently fall down until they get to the fermentation tanks. Then we also have, um, it's, it's a cellar that gives us a lot of flexibility to work in the different vineyards and varieties differently, right? So on some varieties, we want to experiment and play around with, say, whole bunches, whole berries, or slightly crushed ones. And then, as we've seen in the, at the very beginning, we have um, several quality controls prior, prior to that the grapes get into the fermentation tanks. So two of the first, obviously, quality control that we do is in the vineyards because all of our grapes are being handpicked, all of them. Then, then we have two quality controls that go automatically, and the fourth one is on the on the um, selection table. So basically four quality controls prior to that the grapes get into the fermentation tanks. All gravity driven and it's small fermentation tanks of only 42 hectoliters. Um, so we're really able to keep the small parcels um, separate until the very end. And then only we decide on how we're gonna do 
uh, the final blends. And as you can see, all the cellars that we've just visited, they're all connected, all underground. So even where I'm standing here, that's also down here, there is a cellar. As I said, the deepest cellar that we have is, is about 10 meters below ground, which obviously is great that, uh, so we don't have to use too much energy for cooling because everything is tempered. I mean, is, is at this pretty much stable temperature all year round. Oh, 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 oh,